Well, good evening and welcome back to the Orthodox Catechism Online. Tonight's session discusses the person of the Holy Spirit. And before I launch into the content of the presentation, I have to make a confession. It's a confession I've made before, but that is to say I find this particular evening the most difficult of all our topics. And one of the, the one of the reasons for this, which will become clear over the next few minutes, is that there's in many ways less to say about the Holy Spirit than there is to say about the person and work of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean there isn't anything to say, but um, because the person of the Holy Spirit and his study, that is what we call pneumatology, lies outside of my own uh, natural field, it's an area that I sort of struggle to really get into. Um, that said, uh, what you're going to experience tonight is slightly different to what we've uh, used in the past for other groups of uh, students of the catechism. Uh, and so far as I've gone through more material and tried to sort of update some of what I have to say, and hopefully you'll find it helpful. With that, I want to uh, remind you that last week we looked at the person of Christ. We focused on him in a way that we did not on the three persons of the Trinity in our first session, partly for similar reasons to those I just expressed regarding the person of the Holy Spirit. Because God makes himself known to us materially in the man God, in the incarnate Logos, in Jesus Christ, because we have an historic experience of him, he's easy to talk about. And what I mean is, of course, the church has centuries of debate around his person and what it is he accomplished in the flesh for us. Um, that really, you might argue, has carried on even into the present and has implications for the life of the whole church. The person of the Holy Spirit most certainly has implications for the life of the whole church, but because he is not an incarnate person of the Trinity, we can say less about him in concrete um, words the way we can about the word that takes on flesh. So the reasons for my trepidation in discussing the person of the Holy Spirit really lie in that fact. But I'm going to share my screen with you now, and hopefully you can uh, see what's in front of you. The Holy Spirit. Here I've used an icon that we're going to look at more closely in a moment, but it is one of the manifestations of the church's experience of the third person of the Trinity. The study of the Holy Spirit is called in technical terms pneumatology, and this is from the word pneuma, which means either breath or wind, and ology, of course, as we said with respect to the person of Christ, and the word Christology means a word about or the study of. So pneumatology is what we are um, indulging in tonight. As I open by saying, the Holy Spirit is depicted in different ways across Christian tradition. The Holy Spirit does not take on, um, he does not take on flesh. And because we don't see him, we, um, can only speak of him from, first of all, revelation, that which we are told about him by God himself, um, as he declares through the prophets, as he declares, for example, to King David, um, who is the composer of many of the Psalms, and as, we, uh, as he is revealed to us by Jesus when Jesus himself refers to the Holy Spirit. But when we depict him, we do so symbolically. I cannot stress that enough. And you can see it in iconography. So here, we see the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. The first time we encounter him that way 
is at the uh, at the recounting of the baptism of Jesus when he emerges from the waters, and the passage reads that the Holy Spirit descended upon him as a dove. At which point the Father declares of the Son, "Lo, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him." The important uh, feature in that sentence, though, is the as. In other words, when we describe the Holy Spirit as a dove, it is in the form of a simile, like a dove, not that he is a dove or that he is and can be properly depicted as a dove. Another way is as fire. And here you can see the uh, flames. This is a, a, an icon of the Pentecost, at which point the disciples, you might say, become apostles. That is, they are fully equipped to carry the message of Jesus out into the world. And they can do this because the Holy Spirit essentially ordains them, makes it possible for them to uh, undertake this work in the full power of God. And that's ultimately what um, the moment of Pentecost is about. And finally, breath. And you can't see breath in this icon as a rushing wind. Maybe if um, the icon had been painted in a uh, form whereby the, the flame was flickering, uh, it might be more obvious. But the fact is the breath um, that we use to speak of the Holy Spirit uh, cannot be seen. And so it's not an obvious uh, feature in uh, in our depictions. We just assume his ever presence. So prior to the um, moment of Pentecost, we read this in the Gospel of John. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So here, in that last sentence, he breathed on them. There is the association of the Holy Spirit with breath. And what does the Holy Spirit do then? Well, he empowers the disciples. He makes it possible for them to undertake the work that is set before them. By contrast, or in um, relation to that passage, but subsequent to it, from the Acts of the Apostles, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There we have it again, empowerment, and we see um, a glimpse of what lies before the disciples, now apostles. They are being sent, and that which they um, are um, tasked with is represented, at least in part, by this gift we sometimes call the speaking in tongues, which is the idea that, the, that these apostles will go out into the world and carry the gospel to all peoples. So in the first instance, the Holy Spirit gives them the power to uh, forgive and retain sin. Here he is 
giving them power to essentially go out and to preach the gospel. Now, who the Holy Spirit is caused some consternation. What I have found very interesting when I've looked through the texts of the early church fathers is that in so many cases, the reality of the Holy Spirit is taken for granted. So there's no denying that the Spirit exists, but there was denial on the part of some that the Spirit was anyone different to God himself. There is denial of some that he was a full person. There is a failure, failure to understand on the part of many that he is a third person of the Holy Trinity, that he is in fact um, very much um, a reality as part of the Godhead. This comes to the fore by the time of the Second Ecumenical Council. Now, back up for a moment and think historically about what we looked at last week when we were talking about the person of Christ. I said then that a full Christology or an understanding that the one whom we worship, Jesus Christ, is fully God and fully man is present in the church, but it takes up to eight centuries for it and its implications to be fully articulated. And um, this is also the case with the Holy Spirit. The first ecumenical council, the first council of the church called for 325 in Nicaea, establishes that Jesus Christ is divine and not as Arius would have it, the great heresiarch from Alexandria, not as he would have it, that Christ was divine, but in some uh, subsidiary position to God the Father, rather that he was um, truly God. He was of one substance with homoousios. And however they however successful they were at determining this and and articulating it in the words of the first draft of the creed that we recite every sunday there arose some related to this question who said okay fine but what about this holy spirit and through all sorts of arguments and from different angles uh there were there emerged a, an identifiable group that fought against the idea that the holy spirit was a person and these were the pneumatomachi or the pneumatomachians um and that simply means fighters against the spirit they're also known as the macedonians named for a one-time uh patriarch of constantinople and um, they said that the Holy Spirit might have been a power, but was not a person. So at the second ecumenical council held at uh, Constantinople in 381, the creed has added to the draft the um, I guess the third paragraph in which we then say, and in the Holy Ghost the, or the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. So the first draft of the creed written um, for Nicaea in 325 um, establishes very clearly that Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is of one substance with the Father. In other words, he is fully God. And then it says the same thing about the Holy Ghost, but about 50 years later.
the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. There is no ambiguity left as to his reality, as to his uh, participation in the life of the Godhead, more than participation in the life of his actual part in the life of the Godhead. So that uh, took place at the Second Ecumenical Council in 381. The fathers of the church are most concerned with upholding this fact. So I looked at uh, St. Basil the Great's treatise on the Holy Spirit. And what it is really is um, a, a philosophical, theological treatise establishing the certainty of the Holy Spirit's personhood. And um, even for that, it doesn't do a lot to illumine us as to what he does. Um, it's almost as if I get from the you know the various uh, readings uh, of of the fathers, as if the operation of the Holy Spirit is somehow understood, and I expect that it really was because of the society that we're talking about at that time. The peoples of the church um, are not long separated from, you know, the idol worshiping masses. And that can sound like I'm being derisive. I just mean rea realistically, anthropologically, people were accustomed to seeing the world in a spiritual way. They would have assumed the reality of, um, of interaction between the natural world, the visible, measurable, empirical, fleshly world, and the spiritual, invisible world. And so to speak about the Holy Spirit perhaps would not have caused them the same kind of difficulties that we might have in our uh, materialistic context. But that's really, in establishing um, who the Holy Spirit is, um, uh, emblematic of, of the conversation, of the discussions that went on at the time, because they were most concerned um, with distinguishing the person of the Holy Spirit from a mere power. He is the power of God, but um he is no less a person for it and so someone like saint basil very concerned with uh, making it clear that the holy spirit is one of the three persons of god the holy trinity but that that brings us to what we actually know about the person of the holy spirit well i think we can safely say the following statements. The Holy Spirit is one of the persons of the Godhead. So that is established creedally. In other words, we've built it into our statement of faith, the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. But that, of course, doesn't come from nowhere. The Holy Spirit appears across the holy, the whole of the Holy Bible. So whether you're looking at um, the book of Genesis, or um, reading through the Psalms, the Holy Spirit is constantly making an appearance. God's people, whether we're talking about the ancient Hebrews or the people of Second Temple Judaism, in other words, the people, the, 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 the Jews of Palestine who uh, rebuild the temple after their exile, um, and the, the faith that that had built up then, um, they, they all seem to take for granted that God's spirit can be spoken about as he acts in their midst. Of course, they don't yet identify him as a person of the Godhead, but 
he is very much present and recognized as such. It's when we get into the Gospels that we start to encounter him in these concrete personal terms. And ultimately, these are um, uh, nailed down, you might say, by the church in the Second Ecumenical Council. But one of the reasons is that Jesus himself speaks about the Spirit. And, um, you know, if you were to do a search through the Gospels for mentions of the Holy Spirit, you would find that they're quite numerous. That's quite apart from the moments where we see him, the Holy Spirit, conferred on the disciples in order to equip them for their forthcoming ministry. But most vitally, the Holy Spirit is not to be confused with the mere energy of God. And we're going to see why in a few moments. But it is really to demean him, to uh, demean his place as one of the persons, and to undermine any sense of the saving mission of God amongst God's people, to confuse the Holy Spirit with the mere, I'm saying mere in inverted commas, but the mere energy of God. But ultimately, the Holy Spirit is he who dwells with and empowers the Christian. And that's what we're going to see more of in a moment in terms of sort of how that is um, uh, possible and, and what effect it has. And the Holy Spirit is everywhere present and fills all things. Those are words I've stolen from uh, a prayer priests and deacons and many of the faithful uh, recite regularly O heavenly king advocate spirit of truth who art everywhere present and fill, fillest all things treasury of blessings bestower of life come and dwell within us cleanse us of all that defiles us and a good one save our souls there is no place that the holy spirit is not and as we look at the mission of the Holy Spirit, particular to the people that God has called out of the world to be his disciples, to be members of the body of Christ, even beyond that picture, the Holy Spirit is operating. But what does any of this mean? Well, you should recognize the diagram in front of you from our Christology diagram uh, presented to you last week. Here we have God and creation. This is in the first days. Creation and God in intimate relationship. God has established creation and declared that uh, the crown of creation, human beings are made in his image and likeness. But of course, as I told you last week, we ourselves um, create distance between us and God. We do that by, by disobedience, by sin. And so a chasm opens up. And this chasm is bridged or is closed by the work of the incarnate Logos. So what does God do? to repair the damage we inflict through sin, this chasm, he sends his word into the world. And his word, obviously we're, we're speaking uh, by way of metaphor here, but his word descends from above, takes on flesh, and here that's represented by the star. Um, you might say that's the major of Bethlehem. The word grows and ministers, healing, teaching, um, until such time as he offers himself in sacrifice, completing the temporary sacrifices that had been offered by the first priestly peoples, the Hebrews, um, completing that, but of course not leaving it there, rather rising again, walking with us for a final period of time, preparing us to become the church before then ascending 
into heaven, returning to the right hand of God the Father. So I used, or I, I think I described it this way last week, but I called that like a cosmic embrace by the creator of his uh, fallen or separated creation. But God does more than that. While we can imagine that that would be enough to save um, creation from its, its doom of being separated from God forever, God doesn't leave it there. Rather, he empowers creation to carry on that work of the incarnate Logos. And that orange scribble is meant to represent the fire of the Holy Spirit. But how have I depicted it? As a fire that fills the cosmic picture of the um, that has been drawn by the Logos. So the Logos draws the picture. The Holy Spirit fills it in. And creation thereby doesn't become uh, sort of an arid, uh, powerless participant in its um, saved status. Rather, creation is empowered to become an active participant, an active, um, uh, what word am I looking for? An active, well-prepared, well-kitted-out participant in, in salvation. So cosmically, that's a way of depicting the role of the Holy Spirit. As creation is drawn back by means of the ascension, into that union with God, into that restored relationship and indeed enhanced relationship of being in intimate contact with God, it has the ability um, um, to reflect God's likeness again. In other words, the iconological status of creation is reestablished by the work of the Logos and the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit. Um, creation is now a vibrant living uh, icon of, of the God that lovingly created it. What does this mean to the individual and to the church? Well, the fathers sometimes use the son as an analogy to describe the person of the Holy Spirit. How so? Well, here we see the Son in front of us. Let's say it depicts the Father. Well, we can see the Father above, we can see the Son above, but we experience the Son as the Son is communicated to us. Um, it is first as light, the sun, the S-O-N sun, and as warmth, the Holy Spirit. So here we've got the Father, and the sun is analogous to the light. Light is, we say, begotten of the sun. Switch that, though, to the Holy Spirit and its warmth, and the warmth proceeds from the sun. They both emerge and are manifest realities of the sun. They do so in different ways, and we might even be able to apply scientific terminology to that, but uh, they do so in different ways, and both ways are just as important to um, the vibrancy, to the liveliness of the uh, earth that um, the sun illumines. How so? Like this. There we find God, and 
that little uh, shape at the bottom I'm calling the Christian. That is the individual. It might also be the church, but it is a seed. And the seed rests on the ground. In order for it to come to life, it needs two things. First, it requires that um, the, the ground itself is prepared, that the seed itself is ready to be planted. And so here we say, uh, the light of God burns away the contaminants. He purifies the seed, it cracks it open, and it makes it receptive. So that, you can say, is the work of the Logos. The Logos does everything necessary, Christ, that is, does everything necessary to make it possible for us to receive the Holy Spirit whom he promises to send. And here we describe as the warmth of God, warmth which then incubates and nourishes the seed so that the seed grows from the soil in which it's planted up in a Godward direction. It emerges as a fully fledged tree. One without the other doesn't result in um, a, a healthy, fully fledged um, tree, and there is no upward growth. Now that's important because something that Brother Basil said to me as I was waiting for you to gather tonight about last week's session, when we were talking about Christ and Christ's work, I told you that in the Latin West, and that applies as much to Protestantism as to Catholicism, Christ being depicted on the cross only or primarily um, engenders the idea in people's minds that his work is limited to the atonement, the, sa the, the saving from sin, and that it's a once and for all event. But from an Orthodox point of view, that's problematic because we don't understand salvation as a once and for all event. Rather, it's something that requires continual participation on our part. I'm going to say that again because it's so vital. It requires continual participation on our part. Christ has done the work, but it is now for us to grow in um, and appropriate the results of that work. St. Paul describes it as working out our salvation. And that is what St. Seraphim of Serov taught when he, in his work on the acquisition of the Holy Spirit, said that that was the very purpose of the Christian life. St. Seraphim said in answer to a question put to him that ultimately um, it is never enough just to believe, go to church, undertake um, to fast, to pray, and to undertake good deeds. All of these things appear to be good on their own, but if undertaken without the goal of growing in the Spirit, without the goal of acquiring the Holy Spirit, they don't um, lead to growth the growth that we need to emerge um, as fully fruitful trees from the ground. And uh, when our actions are divorced from uh, the pursuit of the Holy Spirit, they tend to become static, arid, um, and even when they're well-intentioned, uh, um, do not lead to the same sort of fruitfulness. So, in review, the Holy Fathers of the Church, and I'm talking specifically about, the, the, say, the Fathers of the Conciliar Period, but especially in the 4th and 5th centuries when um, the question of 
the person of the Holy Spirit was very much the topic du jour. Our concern with establishing absolutely that the Holy Spirit is a person of the Godhead that we believe in and worship and live in relationship to God, the Holy Trinity. But beyond that, much as to the Holy Spirit's operation is taken for granted in the sense that his presence and his activity is invisible, less easy to define, though no less real than the activity of the Logos incarnate, than the activity of Jesus Christ, but that he is everywhere um, at all times. And we are called upon to acquire him, to live in his presence and to have him live within us. And in a personal sense, I have to say that I, if I reflect on language that was used when I was uh, being catechized myself as a child and as I've grown up in the faith, um, a lot of lip service has been paid to the Holy Spirit, not deliberately, not because people have meant to somehow uh, demean his reality, but because it's not been understood. It hasn't been assumed in the same way that in Orthodoxy we uh, declare him regularly. And in the case of St. Seraphim of Serov, would even say that his acquisition uh, our life in him is the purpose of the Christian life. Um, what do I mean, though, by saying that uh, the Holy, the, that the Church, the Orthodox Church, continually sort of manifests him and declares him? It's no accident, and we're going to say much more about this when we talk about liturgy in a future session, but that everything we do is done in threes. So if I sense the altar, listen to the sets of the ringing bells of the of the of the censer of the thurible as it's sometimes called. It's in patterns of three. Every time uh, we pray, whether it's collectively or whether it's one of the priest's prayers, the person of the Holy Spirit is present in those prayers as an active participant. And the example par excellence is the anaphora. Now, that's not a word I expect you to remember now, although we will talk about it when we discuss liturgy. The anaphora is the Eucharistic prayer. That is the great and long prayer um, offered by the priest over the bread and wine um, and, and represents the summit, you might say, of the whole divine liturgy because it's during that prayer that we actually ask for God's presence in our midst and that he might transform the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. By whom? Explicitly by the work of the Holy Spirit. That is not something that has ever been traditionally a part of the Latin tradition which is quite interesting. In other words, there is a diminished um, recollection of the Holy Spirit in Western tradition that I think in Orthodox tradition is declared continually and one that um, we, uh, that we actually worship in uh, regularly. I could say a lot more. I'm conscious that last week, I think I spoke for over an hour myself and didn't leave as much time for questions. But that ends the section that I wanted to present to you. And so I would open it up to questions or comments um, from your end at this point. Yes. Yeah, turn around, there we go. <laughs> yep. Uh, just wondering, you said earlier on that the, the Father and the Son worship the Holy Spirit together. Why why does the Father, the Most High, 
worship an aspect of his own creation. Does that, does that make sense? It does make sense, but I'm not sure I said that. Uh, or you, either you may have misunderstood me or I may have misspoken. But to be clear, the three persons, there's no worship um, within the three persons. There is love within the three persons, always love. Um, and that they um, attract our worship. So worship is always a, um, a creation response. It's it's the response of creation to creator. It's a human response to, to God. But none of the, the persons of the Trinity worship each other. However, the dynamic between them is always a dynamic of love. And that in itself is really important because I've shown you a couple of times, and we're going to uh, see it again uh, on a few occasions across the rest of this course, but that that picture of creation and God, or sorry, creator and creation at the beginning, the two spheres um, that, I've, that I've drawn on that slide. Cre creation, we would say, arises precisely because of that economy of love, that flow of love between the three persons. So it's a dynamic relationship within the Trinity. God is love. That's an easy phrase to say. It's one that comes to us from scripture and it's one we believe, but actually it also makes a good deal of sense. There are three persons. God in his dynamism as three persons, is a loving being and that love flows continually between the three but that love isn't confused with isn't to be confused with worship so if i did say that as i say i, I would have misspoken um or else you you uh, got the wrong words but uh, either way does that make sense yeah 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 that makes sense thank you um, so uh, another thing was um i kind of stumbled with the personification of it mm -hmm. it's all just in my mind, um, like a person is an identity. Mm -hmm. I struggle with the like the ineffability of the father, then having a person attached. Like how how can the ineffable have its own identity? And then also, would the Holy Spirit be like a person with no person that has an identity, but it's an unknowable identity, whereas Christ is the knowable identity? Does that does that make sense? Yes, and thank you for that. First of all, you've con um, you you um, you're not allowing me to get away with any easy answers. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best here. If you reflect back on the the very first session when I tried to illustrate the Trinity, now I know um, you may not remember, which is okay. Just take a look at the the YouTube recording I put up. But I had the three figures, the three persons, and then I merged them and i said that um you know i i put word in and i said that the word emerges from the body this is an imperfect analogy as all analogies are but i'll i'll return to it right now just because i know it helps me as imperfect as it is if i was to turn my screen off right now but to keep talking to you you would know that i was present right? Um, because you'd hear my voice. You'd know that Father Jacob, right now, you know that Father Jacob is present because he's on screen. You can see that person move and you can see my physicality. If I turn my screen off, you wouldn't see me, but you'd still know I was present because you would hear my word. You would hear my voice. Now, we know from analysis sorry before i say that i'll go back for a moment and say the me that is present that you can this determine um by sight is the same me that speaks so both the sight of me and the sound of me are expressive of a single identity but they both have identities in and of themselves. You following so far? Yeah. This is my body. This is my logos, my word, my wisdom, whatever you want to call it. And then the third um, clue 
to my presence with you would be the fact that I could not speak without my breath carrying my word forward in the first place. And though you don't see it and you hardly hear it, it's fundamental to the fact that I'm speaking to you right now. Mm -hmm. And you might even hear it if we were all quiet enough and I turned my screen off and my microphone picked up the fact that I was breathing. And as imperfect as it is, that's always helped me think of the persons of the Trinity. They're all expressive of a oneness, and yet each one of those things is also um, decipherable. Each one of those things is identifiable as a thing in and of itself. And so um, God is person, and the persons of the Trinity are um, are true persons within the person. They're, again, imperfect analogy, but the triangle, right? You have a single triangle, but each angle within the triangle, we might geometrically determine that one is angle A, one is angle B, one is angle C. They're all absolutely identical, all expressive of the same degrees, right? But also distinct. Absolutely one, but also distinct. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Brilliant question, though. Thank you. I've got some. I've got some questions, Father. You fire away, and then I'm going to go to Michael, followed by Irene. So you fire. Go. Um. So. Could you speak more on why the dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit? So I always found it a bit strange because, you know, the dove being a bird that kills for pleasure. So you speak more on why why the dove being the, the symbol of the Holy Spirit in particular. I think we, whatever our empirical knowledge of creatures is, we have to sometimes divorce that from their poetic uh, power, right? So, for example, um, a serpent, right? We say the word serpent, and even the word will conjure up images of duplicity, images of dishonesty, of sneakiness, of danger, right? But the serpent is also um, an, an, uh, um, what am I trying to say? It's also um, well, it's image, the medicine. Yes, exactly. And also, you know, an image of, of Christ or of the cross, Moses lifting up the serpent. The, the, the fact is that, um, you know, they haven't examined a serpent. And of course, there are various species, uh, but they haven't examined a serpent to um, derive from that creature a certain poetic power. And... We've always talked about, um, you know, doves as pure. It's a dove that brings back the olive branch to signal to Moses that um, that the that the flood is subsiding. Uh, did I say Moses? Noah. Um, that to to signify to Noah that the flood is subsiding. Um, you know, uh, Jesus himself uses the. Um, the uh, device when he says be wise as serpents innocent as doves i mean we could dissect that and say hang on some serpents are quite innocent and so i wouldn't i would be careful to um not allow our sort of um zoological knowledge to get in the way of the poetic association the inherent poetic association of the of the image okay one more question um could you speak a little bit on the difference between, obviously, in orthodoxy, the Holy Spirit emanates from the Father and not, you know, Christ the Son, but obviously in Roman Catholicism, the Holy Spirit emanates from the Father and the Son. Father and the Son. Yes, absolutely, and thank you for that. Um, of course, we call that, for those of you who don't know, the filioque problem. And uh, the filioque problem is, um, it emerges from... Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, in uh, around the uh, 8th century. And it's because there was still a, an Aryan problem there as late as that. 
So five centuries really after the council um, defeated Arianism, there were still Arian Christians. There were still people who subscribed to this idea that Jesus Christ was like a lesser God. So the local church in, I'm going to call it Spain at the time, decided to enhance the creed, to strengthen the creed, to say that the Holy Spirit uh, proceeded from the Son as well as the Father, to um, strengthen this idea that the Son was definitely God. Okay? So, because the Spirit wouldn't proceed from unequals, so they bumped the Son up the way they thought about it, uh, to make it really clear he was an equal and said that the Spirit um, proceeded from both of them. That was a problem for two reasons. The first uh, problem, or the, the first aspect to the problem, is the fact that they did it uni unilaterally. And it, 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 although it takes a couple of centuries before Rome herself does it, it eventually becomes the norm in the West, the whole of the West, to declare that the, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So that's a conciliar ecclesiological problem. In other words, the Western Church didn't ask and didn't seek agreement and didn't debate it. They just did it. Simple as that. But the theological problem as it relates to the Spirit is, and this is really the answer to your question, the fact that at the very least, it diminishes the Spirit. It essentially turns the Holy Spirit into a third wheel. Right? It, it's it's like um, it's like there's the Father, then the Son, and then there's this afterthought that proceeds from both of them. Whereas, if you back up and consider the Father as God, the Father is. I hate using terms like this, but to borrow from philosophy, the first principle, but eternally present with Him and as as much uh, true of him as of each other is the logos and the spirit the the light and the warmth the word and the breath um they don't the 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 breath doesn't proceed from the word the breath and the word proceed together and it completely throws into disorder the relationships that exist within the Trinity, within the persons of the Trinity, and ends up unintentionally, probably, but ends up subordinating, minimizing the personhood of the Holy Spirit. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for asking. All right, uh, Michael, please. Hi, Father, thanks for that. Um, Father, my question was kind of related to that that last question. Um, it, it struck me as, as you were reading one of the slides, it said, you, you quoted from the Gospel, it said uh, that our Lord, when he visited the the disciples in the in the room, he said he breathed on them. Um, and I just was wondering, what, what does that mean? And is that related to the... to the Because the, it sounds as if that would kind of lend weight to the... The, the Latin argument. I'm just wondering if that what what that kind of means. I'm glad you raised that because even as I read it with you tonight, yeah. I thought, oh, this yeah. is going to come across uh, as uh. having a difficulty. Um, yeah, there are. I remember that Jesus, as fully God and fully man, is a complete participant in um the reality of of god in 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 the godhead but he's equally mm -hmm. acting with us as a man hence the incarnation itself he is imparting to the disciples what see he himself possesses um but that doesn't he he lives fully the life of god therefore it's entirely reasonable that we can expect him to be empowered to share the life of God that he fully lives within. And I think that's what we're seeing in that passage. We're not seeing Jesus um, sort of 
it's, it's a, you might think of it as him introducing us to his brother as opposed to, I know that's very, that's potentially problematic language too, but he's presenting us to um, the, 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 the spirit who, who proceeds um, by imparting that part of his reality to us. Um, so he is distinct, but he's saying by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's sharing that out. Um, so it's an action as opposed to a sign of of equivalence or uh, not a sign of equivalence as a sign of subordination. Right. Does that help at all? Yeah, but I, I was uh, yeah, it it does. I mean, obviously that that happened well before Pentecost, so it's not as if he was then giving the, the Holy Ghost to the to the disciples at that point. So uh, yeah, I, I, I just as you read that, I was kind of struck with what what that meant, what he was doing there. Very much so, and I'm glad you've raised it because it takes me back to the one of the points I made um, a couple of times, and that is that the Holy Spirit is present throughout the Scriptures. And it's another instance where the idea that the Holy Spirit is present and that he's somehow known, but not mm -hmm. as fully known as he would become in the church, mm -hmm. is, is, is manifest there in the sense that never once does Jesus have to explain to his disciples that there is a Holy Spirit. He just says mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit is this. And in that respect, he's using vocabulary that you find in the Psalms and in the prophets. And, you know, so the Holy Spirit is spoken about. And there seems to be just a natural acceptance that um, um, that he can be spoken about, although, um, you know, we, the followers of God are not yet able to articulate you know his personhood they don't they don't know him yet they mm -hmm. they know that there is this reality but they don't know it, his name and they don't they they can't um work in his you know work within him he he continues to operate mysteriously and it's almost like they sense that and so they accept it and then it's at pentecost that he's fully manifest mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah so i get what you mean yeah thanks okay Thank you for asking. Nice. Irene. Hi, yeah, yeah. What I'm trying to understand is, is there a role of the Holy Spirit in salvation? Like, because we are asking for his, his indwelling and then it talks about you can grieve the Holy Spirit. Does he leave? Do we have to ask him back? Is there ultimately a sin that would stop him coming back? Hmm. That's a really important question because we even hear in the gospels that there is the sin of the holy spirit which is the unforgivable sin um and frankly it's a mystery as to what that is precisely it does seem to me if you take saint seraphim and his teaching about the acquisition of the holy spirit seriously that um the unforgivable sin is a rejection of the spirit. And what that would mean, of course, it would automatically lead to um, an exit from salvation because you'd be rejecting the very possibility of growing in that salvation. So when St. Paul says that we work out our salvation, what he's really saying is that here we have been saved here god has done everything for us it is incumbent on us to respond to that now if we don't respond to it then the the failure to respond is a rejection of the salvific work of god in the first place does that make sense and a failure to respond is a failure to do what Saint Seraphim of Seraph speaks about, and that is to acquire the Holy Spirit, to grow in the Holy Spirit. So if we go back to that seed in the ground image, you know, we can acknowledge the fact that the sun is coming down on us and say, 
well, you know, the seed of me has been broken open and made ready, to, you know, for fertilizing, for growth. And then just say, now I can lay back and not do anything. Or I can reach for the sun. You know, I can, I can say, you know, pour out more upon me, so to speak, so that I might grow and become fruitful. Um, if we don't do the latter, then we inevitably kind of wither and die. We sort of judge ourselves, essentially, by that rejection, by that failure to respond. I know it's a hard analogy because seeds aren't animate. <laughs> you know, so it doesn't quite work, but we are. And if we are that seed, then um, we need to do what a seed, of course, um, by its own nature can't do. We need to um, seek to grow. We need to seek to appropriate for ourselves, to take on for ourselves the spiritual nourishment that allows us to move up and towards the sun so that we might be ultimately united with the source of our salvation. Um, I'm not sure. Does that, does any of what I just said answer what you're wondering about? Yeah, I think it, um, it's like trying to work out the relationship with Christ, but then the relationship with the Holy Spirit as well kind of thing. So it's trying to work out how that, and then when there's three, the, the time that you spend with each, I don't, I don't know if that matters or not, or... Well, it, I love the question because it's the ultimate Trinitarian question, and we are Trinitarian believers. Um, there, you, you've probably heard the formula, we pray to God the Father uh, through Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit. Everything we do, everything we utter, as long as we are directing it to the eternal God, is be and and we are doing so as christians we are doing so as um co-operators as co-operators with the th with the three persons with the, you know with the fullness of god whenever we pray um i think it is helpful to re recollect that we are praying in the holy spirit do we have to say those words every single time the church does actually you know, think about all of those doxological prayers those prayers of praise that the priest says at the end of each of the litanies for example they're always trinitarian so the church does always pray um recollecting the fullness of the trinity and if we fail to do that because our instinctive prayers the prayers that we fire up to god over the course of our day don't do that that's okay we are members of a church. The church is doing that, right? So if you find yourself talking to Jesus as you stand at a sink or as you sit at a desk or whatever, keep doing it. You know, like don't don't let um, that kind of theological precision bind you to a, a sense of necessity, because prayer counts and our Lord hears it. However. When you can, yes, do recollect that actually Brother Christ, as he is at times, um, and as we can experience him, we, we might also think of as, you know, brother, or, you know, we, we might think in terms of our brother, the Holy Spirit, um, but equally, he's a mystical brother. He takes on a different form and we will, we will experience him differently. We will know him differently and and that's all okay um it would be strange i think if you said that um over the course of your day um when you spontaneously went to pray as you sat at your desk or as you stood at your sink or whatever it is that you were drawn to pray to the person of the holy spirit without acknowledging you know god the father or jesus christ some of that is because Jesus is incarnate, right? We know him in a way that the other persons, um, well, we know the other persons through him, right? We don't, uh, we don't know the other persons in that same kind of direct way. Although we participate in them and we do encounter them.
absolutely by virtue of our baptism, by virtue of our chrismation, by virtue of our participation in the divine liturgy, by virtue of our participation in the life of the church. And so we're constantly relating to the three persons because um, that's uh, that's intrinsic to our life as members of the church, as part of the ecclesia, the community of, of God, the Holy Trinity. Is that okay? Thank you. All right, uh, Peter. Um, so uh, I was wondering while you were speaking about the filioque, um, would it be correct to say that the uh, Father has a um, ontological primacy Or is that incorrect? Ah, oh, that's a good question. There. Sorry for the pause to everybody, but that's a difficult question only because I'm not sure we tend to talk about primacy within the persons of the Trinity. It's a great question. However, the Father the the two persons that is the son and the holy spirit are not and never should be thought of as subordinate and when as soon as we use language of primacy we have the potential to fall into that trap they are a communion of persons within the person right they are communion of 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 ontologies and the Father, when we pray to God, we are praying to the font of the, the fount of all things. And we speak of him as God the Father. Right. The fount of so... all things is constantly um, um, is constantly in uh, in communion with the other two persons. And so um, we identify God the Father as the fount of all things. But I suppose primal, prima, primacy is appropriate insofar as even in the creed, we say eternally begotten of the Father. The Father is still first, right? But there was no time at which the Son was not. And that's so important to remember. And that's going back to the image I used earlier with me speaking and turning my screen off. The, the, what I'm saying out loud is expressive of what's in my head, right? So if I turn my screen off and sat in complete silence, but didn't log off, you could still trust that all those three experiences of me the physical, the logos, the word base, and the breath base, the aspired base, that, that I was still present. And that me, meanness, Father Jacobness is still present and truly manifest in those three aspects. But God is, the three persons are more than aspects, which is why no analogy really works, right? They're persons, they're not aspects. Having said so, for lack of any better language, because we just don't. The Holy Trinity is a mystery. Um, he's he's he has primacy insofar as he is the fount of all things, but the status of Son and Holy Spirit are absolutely present before mm. we receive them. Right. That's yeah, I understand. I understand. It, it was mostly just a question on the language, right? Because it was kind of I was wondering, uh, going into another question, mm -hmm. which is, um, how does the filioque affect that? Well, I think the filioque. If I sat here in silence right now, and I was just breathing because, well, as I did. When you asked your question, I sat back for a moment. I was still breathing. 
the fact that my breath, which is indicative of me, the fact that my breath wasn't dependent on me speaking to be perceived and, and to be to express my living reality um, underscores the independence of the Holy Spirit. You know, the, the fact that the Holy Spirit is independently identifiable. Like breath. Right. But that is just an analogy because your speech is dependent on your breath. Yeah, that is right. That is true. But um, <laughs> let's put some of the biological kind of realities that limit all of these analogies to the side, uh, only because we we just don't have sufficient language. I, I'm sure that um, as we troll um, the fathers, you know, we can we can express it better. Uh, but I mean, I'm not saying mm -hmm. great. I'm just Father Jacob of Cardiff. Um, trying my best here but yes you're right and it, it's a really good question but it does seem to me that um we do diminish our understanding if we say that um you know I, I, if we even suggest for a moment that somehow the holy spirit doesn't exist um without the input of the logos the holy spirit exists he is um, as God is, and um, neither, neither Logos nor Spirit are dependent on one another. Um, they operate together, but that doesn't imply dependence. And the Filioque will always imply dependence and subordination right okay okay i mean i was i was wondering um about how the filioque affects the um would affect perception of god the father though um if you say well the holy spirit proceeds from the father and the son then you have the the father and the son as yeah that's oh I, okay I don't know if you were thinking that at the beginning, and I missed your point. Uh, but whether you were or whether you, you whether you weren't, yeah, that's why I was looking for the language to, yeah. to articulate it. But <laughs> yeah, we we always. I think it's no accident that when we draw a triangle in our in our attempts to illustrate the the idea of the Trinity, you know, it's always drawn this way. Like the the Father is always sort of the 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 topmost angle or normally in terms of uh, uh, at least for convenience um you know you you do you know one is begotten and one proceeds so you're right the the first principle the the, the fatherhood mm. the god um who is complete in himself still uh you know we still have to use uh language that describes the relationship of the other two persons to the father but the father is not the person for which we use language to describe so in that respect the the person of the father has a primacy so i think that's probably sound and probably orthodox what i'd be willing to do is to give this uh even further thought um, and before it becomes a video, um, make any corrections in text over, like uh, uh, by surtext on the video. But um, I, I just want to take your question and see if I can uh, work through it a bit better. But do remember this, Saint mm -hmm. Augustine, and this is one of you know the the my favorite things that he ever said. But he said, you know, um, trying to describe perfectly the mystery of the holy trinity is like trying to um you know describe the sea you know it's yeah. it's um it is one of the great uh um and wonderful uh mysterious and poetic challenges that we human beings have had since since uh we first first became aware of god's fullness in christ so can I leave it there and move on to another question? Can I say a small thing? I yeah. think it's funny. Um, you said triangles are normally 
right about, mm -hmm. I don't know all this right about, um, I thought St. Peter's Triangle can be upside down. And even in my own diagrams, I've sometimes turned it around so that I could get my point across. So, yeah, you, <laughs> you that one. Peter, yeah, that's thank you very was, much. St. Peter's Cross is upside down. Maybe St. Peter's Triangle is upside down, and that's why they why they make up the filioque. We'll take that. <laughs> thank you. Younger. Uh, Father, can you hear me? Yep, very well. So my question is, so in the creed, it says the Holy Spirit is to together worship and glorify with Father and Son. So I was wondering how exactly should we um, glorify the Holy Spirit and worship him in our lives? Okay, great. I mean, first and foremost, we do so by our participation in the life of the church. Um, as I said to Irene earlier, we're, the, when the church prays in liturgical context, we always do so um, mindful of and quite literally expressive of our faith in the three persons of the Godhead. So they, they're always present, and it is both through, with, and in and toward them that we undertake all that we do as a church okay so that's that's our first port of call when it comes to appropriate worship the you know such as you've asked about um but in terms of our personal lives to worship and glorify the the holy spirit is to respond to his gift if you think about Christmas or a birthday or any of the kind of events that we celebrate conventionally, think about somebody giving you a gift. If somebody gives you a gift, the way you show thanks is not just to go, thanks, callously, put it on your kitchen table and never look at it again. The way you show appreciation for the gift is to say thanks, to open it up, to appreciate it, and then to put it to use. Because failure to do any of those things is to kind of fail to show that true sense of thanks. So um, it is like that when it comes to the gift of the Holy Spirit. We are given the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit is given to the church as a whole. The Holy Spirit is given to us at the moment of our chrismation and we are armed with the holy spirit and if we don't respond to him by seeking to grow in him if we don't use that gift by seeking to sort of go beyond where we are at this moment in order to to move towards god the father which is the holy spirit's desire for us then then we fail to use the gift we fail to offer appropriate thanks appropriate adoration in return so the answer to your question is both collective which is a simple answer in a way because it's through the church it's it's in the actions of the church but it's also individual and the individual way isn't to make sure that we mention the holy spirit's name every time we pray necessarily if we can do that because that's the formulations of our prayers fine but that's not what it's about it's about knowing that the holy spirit offers us as gift his power to grow toward god the father to grow in the salvation that christ has made possible and if our if we fail to do that then it's kind of like us taking the gift, setting it on the kitchen table, and not opening it. And if we do open it, not using it. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, that's okay. my sense. Yeah. Thank that's you very good. much for that. Are there any more questions or comments, perhaps to uh, bring us? Oh, I see that I received some in the chat. Yes. So um, it's been said in the chat. Uh, all language is a type of fixative. Um, 
uh, the Holy Spirit is surely that which escapes all attempts to fix it, i.e. to catch it, to catch the wind. All we say must be an approximate, a provisional statement. Um, then the, the final comment there is, this is a comment rather than a question. It's a really good comment. The church has language for God as God has revealed himself to us from the moment of creation, through the law, through the prophets, through the incarnation, through the descent of the Holy Spirit, through the life of the church. And in her wisdom, in the church's own wisdom, uh, she has been able to articulate um, truth about God quite confidently. This has been possible because God himself has given the church the gift of that insight, the gift of that wisdom. And when we start to wrestle with some of that language, it can be very helpful because it can help us grow in our understanding. And as we grow in our understanding, allow us to embrace the persons even more um, uh, with, with greater wonder, with greater love, with greater zeal than we might if we didn't understand who they were or where they were in our experience, in our Christian experience. However, if we become too uh, set on nailing down the terms, then we can become like sophists. We can become like philosophers who just want to play with language. And that will inevitably undermine our own Christian life. I it's all right if you it's all right if you read that I calling it again so I can get it from my notes. I, I'm afraid I can't. Oh, the, the the comment that first came the up. The comment, yeah. It should be you should be able to see it if you open the chat. Oh, I can't I can't see it, no. Okay. All language is a type of fixative. And then um, the Holy Spirit is surely that which escapes all attempts to fix it. That is, to catch the wind. All we say must be uh, an approximate, a provisional statement. And that came to us from Alex. So by way of final word, I would just refer all of you to what I said by way of introduction. Um, and that is, uh, uh, you know, that's going back to our very first session. Everything we discuss here, if you're wrestling with it because, you know, it's conceptually difficult, if you're wrestling with it and finding it too academic, don't for one second worry. Because ultimately, one does not have to be um, an academic to be an Orthodox Christian. In fact, sometimes that can be a hindrance because it can weigh us down. All that we're talking about tonight with respect to the person of the Holy Spirit, one of the hardest topics we have to talk about is, can be invigorating, but also um, if we become too focused on it, can become an obstacle. And I don't want that to be the case for any one of us gathered here tonight or anyone that watches this in the future. By all means, explore the person of the Trinity, how the persons of the Trinity, how they relate to one another and how they uh, grant us their gifts in the story of salvation. Um, as you do that, read St. Basil, read St. Ambrose, read St. Seraphim of Serov, but never worry. Um, it's a matter simply of, um, it's a matter simply of seeking to live it as best you can. And that's something that we undertake together. In other words, it's not something if you find you can't get your head around it, or you find that uh, it's all too confusing, fine. You're joining billions of other Christians through time and through space in feeling the same way. 
it can be beautiful the truth is beautiful but ultimately we're invited to step into it by way of experience and the academic side of it the ideas side of it um is is something that if it enriches us we're always welcome to undertake but um must always come back down to us turning to god with thanks and when we do so most especially liturgically we're doing so alongside the church and with language in which we can be very confident 